I think we've got a really great session today with a lot of experienced people in private credit. Um, my name is Justin Ferrier. I'm the managing partner of Navis Capital, and we invest in non-sponsored deals across Southeast Asia, Australia, and uh, also Hong Kong. So normally what we look for in a, in a deal is uh, low and middle market companies, and as I said, non-sponsored. So before we kick into it, I'd just like each of the panelists to introduce themselves, talk about what they focus on. Okay, thanks, Justin. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Danny from Indus Capital. At Indus, we've been focusing on private credit in Southeast Asia since our inception in 2009. But in recent years, we've also been branching out into growth equity uh, businesses in this region, which also gave us a dual perspective in both uh, debt and equity products uh, for Southeast Asia. And prior to Indies, I spent about a decade at Citigroup uh, Solomon, heading up their special situations unit for Southeast Asia. Hi, I'm uh, Wei Xian. I'm a ma managing director at uh, Seatown Holdings. I manage the uh, private credit fund. Uh, so it's a one and a quarter billion dollar fund, uh, you know, investing in uh, private credit instruments, both sponsor and non-sponsor across uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, so I've been here 11 years. Uh, prior to this, I've, uh, you know, kind of worked at all the different banks, uh, you know, Merrill's, UBS, uh, Morgan Stanley, and the like. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Nitish Agarwal uh, at Ryan Capital Asia. Uh, we set up this platform 10 years ago to do uh, performing credit for middle market companies in Asia Pacific. Again, we do both sponsor and non-sponsor deals, and uh, I think so far we have done more than one and a half billion dollars of uh, middle market loans across Asia PAC. Uh, my experience, I've been in Asia all my life, last 27 years doing Asian debt. Uh, clearly look forward to sharing some of that experience uh, with you tonight. Thank you. Hi, uh, Matt Michelini. I'm the CEO of Apollo Asia Pacific. Um, moved out here nine months ago from New York and appreciate Singapore's uh, warm welcome uh, to, to me and, and Apollo's build out in Asia. Um, we manage about $515 billion across credit, hybrid, and equity. We have about $10 billion invested in Asia, most of that in credit. We have deployed about $2 billion this year in credit in, in Asia. And I think one of our unique setups is um, in, in credit, we have the flexibility and the capital base to go from finding alpha at 200 over all the way up through opportunistic credit, which gives us a bit of a, a flexible mandate and flexible lens to look at the world. Thanks, guys. So right now we live in pretty interesting times, incredibly volatile, a lot of declining liquidity, increasing cost base in our investee companies. But I still think that there is a real rationale for private credit in Asia. And I'd like to explore that with the panel. We've got people that cover regionally and also uh, across specific countries. So, Matt, starting with you, why Asia and why now for private credit? All right, so with the guidance of being rapid fire, um, so I, th I do think it depends on how you define private credit. So let's just stipulate that the definition is you're generating alpha relative to the liquid markets and credit. Um, I think that um, there are major gaps left by the banks um, in credit, and that's always been the case, that, and I think the demand for credit is going to continue to grow in Asia. Um, I think that you're going to see a, re, a, a need for reequitization of the junior parts of the balance sheets over the course of the next several years as the cost of capital goes up and valuations come down. Um, and I think that there is an insatiable thirst for safe yield for clients out in Asia. Um, so that's the rapid fire answer. Excellent. Natish. Yeah, I think why Asia and why now? I think, uh, so again, I think uh, if I see, I think when we started 10 years ago to where we are now, I think there's a sea change in Asian private debt market. Uh, I think the growth from, I think the, gr the demand for capital continues to be strong from the borrowers for growth capital. Clearly, Asia Pac has seen significant amount of real uh, growth rates. So the demand for capital has always been there. But what we have seen change in 10 years is really the supply side. I think now we see a lot more sophisticated institutional investors coming investing in Asia, both uh, for diversification and for relative value. I think typically, I think Asian private debt has given anywhere from 300, 400 basis points over what you could get in other markets. So I think people are seeing relative value in Asia now, what they were seeing earlier. So we have seen, I think, uh, I think likes of insurance companies like Allianz setting up shop here. 
I think Canadian pension plans have come in a big way. Uh, your CPPIB has set up a huge, uh, I think, direct desk. OMERS has invested, uh, they partnered with us. Uh, I think Apollo and other large uh, asset managers have now come in a big way. So clearly, on the supply side, we see a lot which has happened in Asian private debt compared to what it was 10 years ago. And on top of that, uh, on the infrastructure side, again, clearly, I think the legal frameworks have improved quite significantly in many of the markets in Asia PAC, which was always a concern earlier. That definitely, I think, mitigates many of the credit risk, gives more negotiating power to us as creditors. So that's definitely helpful. And finally, I would say, I think the ecosystem that we have been able to build over the last 10, 12 years, whether it is background search firms, financial DD firms, legal DD firms, uh, I think security uh, trustees, uh, specialized security trustees, which have come up, I think that, again, helps uh, reduce the lead time, reduces some of the execution risk. So demand for capital was always there, but supply of capital has significantly improved. And then with the legal infrastructure and the ecosystem, we're definitely in a good place. Excellent. Denny, you've got more of an Indonesian focus, I guess. What about from an Indonesian perspective? Why Asia or why now? Yeah, I think for Southeast Asia, uh, in general and specifically Indonesia, I think the, the key word is this structural funding gap right, in this region and, and in a country like Indonesia. Because uh, the, the region and, and the specific countries has been growing consistently in the past decade or two since Asian financial crisis. But on the funding side, uh, it's been solely relying on commercial banks. Uh, Capital market has not developed, has been lagging, and you know private equity is also is is still a mix uh, in terms of deployment. So I think there is a role to play for everybody, the banks, you know, to increase their loan book in the region, the private equity, and the private credit for us. Yeah, question. Yeah, so. Um the, um, you know, right now there's a lot of, uh, you know, huge funding gaps, as my uh, fellow panelists have uh, mentioned. And uh, maybe just to give you some numbers, um, there's $80 billion of uh, high-yield bonds coming due in uh, Asia uh, this year and next year. And year-to-date in 2022, only $14 billion of, uh, of issuance. So there's a humongous gap, I mean, tens of billions of dollars of uh, high-yield bonds that need to be refinanced, no market to refinance into. And, you know, there's a huge gap for... Uh, private credit to fill. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's on top of whatever uh, you know, existing demand you have from you know, buyout firms you know, seeking leverage and you know, banks being forced to you know, uh, increase their capital charge because of Basel tree not being able to lend to you know, uh, mid-market corporates and the like. So it's, a, it's truly a very exciting time to be in uh, Asian private credit. Excellent. So the panelists have been doing this for a long time and I thought I'd just ask them you know, what are the areas of opportunity and particularly some of the new trends that are coming out in private credit? Denny, starting with you. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, you know, historically, private credit actually has been around in, in Asia or Southeast Asia for a long time, but it's coming out from Asian financial crisis. But for the longest time, it's been more on the special sit type of situation which is you know, very high yield uh, risk and, and return. But I think the growth in the coming years is going to be more in the, the so-called direct lending, if you follow the, the trajectory that the US and Europe is having. And that actually is creating a flywheel effect uh, in terms of investor you know, getting comfortable with private credit in, in this region. And on the borrower side, is also getting more and more educated about the benefit of private credit as compared to issuing equity that is more relative to them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you know, the first few uh, private credit funds that came up in Asia, a lot of them were spin-offs from, you know, XYZ investment banks, uh, special states groups. Uh, now that's obviously broadening. I mean, you've got uh, obviously you know, a lot of, uh, you know, big buyout funds, uh, you know, looking for private credit to support their transactions. You've got you know high yield bonds and refinancing. You've got uh, you know unicorns coming to you because of uh, you know they want to avoid the down round. So you've got all these uh, you know a fairly wide range of uh, different types of deals. And uh, the benefit of private credit is that we can provide you know sort of tailored structured uh, structured solutions for 
you know, different, uh, different people. We can have, you know, the loan structures, bond structures. We can have uh, structures with, uh, you know, warrants attached. I mean, there's, there's a, a fairly wide range of uh, products and solutions that we can provide. Got it. Natish, you've just about or have closed a pretty interesting venture deal. Mm-hmm. Is this something that we're gonna, you're going to see a lot of trends in, in venture debt? Is that market going to develop? Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, so right. So we did, I think, our first venture debt deal uh, in Indonesia or Southeast Asia. Uh, but this is, again, it's a part of the trend. I think a lot of these companies have done really well. And uh, I think they've raised a lot of equity. And they're the right time for them to think about uh, whether the next dollar of capital should come from equity or should come from debt. And clearly what's going on with the equity markets is not also helpful on the equity raise side. So we see very good companies uh, with very good sponsors, very good equity cushions sitting there, and uh, where uh, private debt players can then provide uh, the next round for uh, the capital that they need. So yeah. we definitely see this uh, going to become a lot more prominent and dominant, uh, which so far has been really on the edge since till, I think about last year. Part of the reason, again, the companies were not that big, and second, I think uh, equity was available at, uh, at, at very good valuations. So I think with I think what's going on with the valuations and the equity per se, plus the size of the companies are such that, I think in terms of the credit risk, it's something that uh, kind of gets into the zip code which uh, private debt would look at. So we definitely see that trend uh, becoming more and more dominant as we go forward. Got it. Matt, you're relatively new to Asia. What trends are you seeing here that are different or the same in the US in, in, and, and Europe? Uh, good question. Um, I would echo uh, Denny's comments about direct origination generally being a growth area in, in Asia. And that will be across uh, a couple different geographies, uh, very investable geographies, uh, including Australia, Korea, um, India, and probably even to some extent Japan over a medium term. Um, I think some of the more interesting trends we're also finding are, again, start where the banks have pulled back. Um, trade finance is interesting. Um, I think there's lots of innovation still left to go to do on mortgages. I think climate and energy transition funding is there's a lot of alpha to be driven across the capital structure there. Um, I think GP, I think GP and LP solutions to help reposition their portfolios um, is also a very interesting uh, business, especially in Asia as the capital markets have shut down for traditional way exits. Um, I also one of the other big strategies we have is what we call. Um, so helping investment grade companies solve sub investment grade problems. Um, we've done a deal with SoftBank uh, in Europe. We've done a deal with Air France. Um, we've done a deal with Anheuser Busch. And more and more Asian companies are looking for this because here you either have the banks saying we can't syndicate it, or they're saying we're already overexposed to you anyhow. So we we can't we can't provide you this solution. So that's why I think the, a flexible approach for our platform is important because. We do see these uh, pockets of, uh, of opportunities where you can create alpha and scale, but it's not, just, it's not just one product. It's not just one trend we're capitalizing on. It really is trying to fill in where the banks have left, have left off, um, and also the demand for innovation from the consumer side and business side for, uh, for different well-structured uh, credit products that are priced appropriately. It's interesting, um, none of the panelists really focused on special situations. So special situations used to be the new black, as it was known. So, uh, Denny, are NPL's special situations ever coming back? I mean, in China, it, it, you're seeing default rates of 30%. I mean, I, I'm not sure if anyone's focused on China, but what's your view on, on NPL's special sits? I think I would, I would uh, separate the two, right, between NPL portfolio and special seed. Uh, NPL portfolio for the region that I cover, which is Southeast Asia, has never been picked to start with, even during uh, Asian financial crisis. If you remember, it was, it, was, it was big for a brief period of time in Thailand, and that's pretty much focusing on consumer finance uh, type of loan. It's never been you know, taking off in the places like Indonesia uh, and so on. And I think largely because there's no, uh, there's no structural or regulatory pressure from the government for the banks to clean up. So the banks will end up just, you know, amortize the losses over time instead of uh, selling. 
And because of that, there's not enough uh, ecosystem, you know, like servicing companies uh, and so on and so on to, to ever taking off. Yeah. So I don't think NPL portfolio is still going to be, uh, is also going to be taking off in the future. But special set, I think depending on what is the definition of special set, you know, I guess in my definition is, you know, anything that is very high yield and, you know, can be a semi-equity risk. I think that has been, has been around for a long time and I think it will continue to, to be around to right. complement the, new, the newer product like a direct lending. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tish, I know you've got a third of your portfolio in India. I'm not sure what NPLs are like in India. Maybe 10% or, but I mean, <laughs> can you ever imagine developing a, an NPL or more special sits business in India? So, so yes, I think uh, NPLs are definitely higher. Than, I hope they're not as high as 30%, but they're definitely not as low as what's being reported. I think clearly the moratorium during the COVID helped, uh, I think, uh, hide some of the NPLs and some of that is likely to come out. But we don't really see any systemic risk, I think, where suddenly the NPLs are just going to blow out of proportion. I think uh, the overall economy still seems to be okay. And yes, I think the NPLs will go up. Uh, the new IBC laws have definitely helped the creditors to clean up some of that. We'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, okay, yeah. fair enough. I'll quiz you on that. Okay. <laughs> so overall, yes, uh, I think uh, we expect NPLs to go up, but uh, not in a dramatic way. And a lot of those would be, I think, uh, folk, I think concentrated in certain sectors, which uh, have been through pain. And I think uh, there you really need to have very dedicated workout uh, teams to really work that out. So we don't expect any, any outsized real opportunity there where uh, you have, a, I think, asymmetric risk return that you can tap there. Um, yeah, so I'll answer the question, but I want to uh, talk about MPLs for a second, too. Um, we generally agree on the MPL side. If you look at the banks in the U.S., just look at the Citrix deal. I mean, the banks will lose a billion dollars on that deal. Um, you look in Europe, they're going to go through similar pain. Any bank with exposure in Asia is, that's where they're going to continue to earn money and they're not going to take their losses because they, know, they have known losses with marks, with risk they have to move in the U.S. and Europe. And so I, I agree. I'm, I'm not sure you'll see a big wave of NPLs. What we've seen with regional bank behavior and how they're dealing with, N, with, how they're dealing with NPLs in their books is um, you don't see the recognition of those losses coming through yet, but you see them... Um, for lack of a better word, shaking down their good borrowers to get quick repayment so that they're able to get, generate liquidity and capital so that they can leg into taking losses over time if they have to, but they'd rather just extend and pretend. So that's some of the behavior that we see from the banks, and we see that because we have the ability to look at stuff IG and very high, high-rated sub-IG um, in, our, in our fund. The reason I didn't mention special sits in the past is special sits historically has been associated with, as Denny mentioned, distressed or junior parts of the cap structure. We, we don't love passive uh, or passive par, um, or small positions uh, being junior in the cap structure. We've always looked at, if we're going to be junior in the cap structure, we want some upside convexity. And so there we, gen, we tend to partner with, we tend to offer partnership capital that looks more like MES or more, looks more like equity. Um, and there we've always used an equity mindset, an equity diligence approach as opposed to a credit approach. And so we look at that a little bit in our, in our equity business. I do think that trend is going to be significant in Asia because as valuations come down, LTVs come down, cash flow coverage ratios come down, leverage, like leverage on an LTV basis has gone up. They're going to have to re-equitize the balance sheets um, for companies that want to grow, companies that want to do M&A, companies that need defensive refinancing help. Um, and so we look at that a little bit uh, as definitely a higher yielding strategy, but we approach that with an equity diligence lens. Like we really want to, we really want to have to own the equity to get involved in a junior special sit, especially given how volatile valuations are and it's unclear where valuations settle as central bank tightening uh, you know, continues to, to progress. At the same time, we don't, uh, you know, we, we don't do, uh, you know, distress debt or, uh, you know, buy NPL portfolios. I mean, we feel that our time is better spent, uh, you know, actually finding, uh, you know, good credits and, you know, situations where you can actually lend to, a, you know, a, a, maybe a borrower that's actually okay, but, you know, where maybe the markets maybe are not conducive or, you know, refinancing or, you know, something needs to be done in a hurry. So there's, there's actually, uh, you know, there's, there's so much going on in Asia, so many different regulatory regimes, so much happening on the, you know, macroeconomic front. 
that uh, you can actually you know, generate those kind of uh, you know, fairly decent returns uh, without having to go into workouts and you know, spending a lot of time. Because uh, at the end, when, when you're uh, you know, getting into workouts, it's, uh, it is a very time-consuming exercise and it's really not a very uh, you know, kind of efficient use of uh, human capital. Yeah. Just changing gears here and looking at some of the macroeconomic risks and some of the challenges that gives us Inflation, declining liquidity, geopolitical risk, demand destruction, it, it just goes on, right? I just ask the panellists, uh, how do you manage those risks? Which ones do you think are important and how are you managing them in your portfolios? So maybe I can go first. So, so obviously, I think the risks are real and uh, they need to be managed. Uh, uh, again, Again, the good thing is uh, at the macro level, obviously everybody will get impacted, but we in Asia are still in a relatively good place compared to other parts of the globe just because of the, the real GDP growth rates we have. So we have some tailwind which can help us uh, absorb some of, the, some of the stuff which is going on. But uh, I think uh, with the macro risk where they are, which you can't control, I think uh, there has to be even more focus on the micro risk that you take uh, when you're looking at the credit, uh, the borrowers you lend to, the industries you work with, uh, where you are in the cap structure, where the leverage is. Clearly, I think we have moved up in terms of the size. I think one thing that came out was that the smaller companies really struggled a lot more during COVID with liquidity, uh, keeping themselves uh, surviving. So clearly, larger companies, your risk goes down disproportionately on the micro basis. Uh, another thing that has worked well in Asia has been working more with sponsors. I think, again, that, that again proved true during COVID where sponsors had the liquidity to put in, uh, get the companies to the working capital when everything was very tight, the businesses had shut down. So definitely, I think uh, the focus has to be a lot more on managing the micro risk and to, and to basically uh, move up the risk curve. I think the good thing is the pricing has also gone up. So you really don't have to take uh, so much risk for whatever returns you want to make. You can definitely, I think, uh, go up in terms of the risk curve, in terms of the lower risk curve, and still get to the returns that you need to, but the risks are real and uh, they need to be actively managed. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'll add yeah. to that. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, in Asia, we've uh, learned a lot of lessons the hard way from the uh, Asian financial crisis, uh, you know, over 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, as part of, part of my uh, misspent youth, I was uh, uh, once upon a time a bond trader in Jakarta. And uh, that was, uh, you know, a very exciting time. And you could see the, uh, you know, the mismatches there, you know, were, were I think a lot more obvious, uh, you know, the there was, you know, obviously central bank reserves were, you know, a fraction of what they are now. I think the, uh, I think Asia's really grown up a lot in terms of uh, being able, you know, sort of strengthening the uh, their balance sheets, uh, you know, their their reserves, and you know, it, every, I think we're a much better uh, position to to deal with the shocks. But the stress will come. I mean, it's just a matter of time. I mean, you're starting to see now, uh, you know, the pressure is mostly on G3 currencies, uh, you know, dollar against everyone else, you know, pound, euro, and yen. But uh, I think at some point it will uh, broaden out to, uh, to other uh, currencies because the dollar is a reserve currency. You know, everyone's got to you know, repay their, their dollar loans and there's just way too much leverage in the system. Uh, a lot of which was, you know, I guess, frankly speaking, the, you know, the Fed allowing, uh, you know, calling this transitory and allowing it to kind of get a bit out of hand. It could have been uh, you know, started a year ago. But uh, you know, I, think, uh, I think Asia is better positioned to, uh, to deal with this. And I think uh, you know, but there will be opportunities for a private credit to get involved. So, Denny, you're an absolute return fund. Mm -hmm. How do you, what are you thinking about in interest rate risk? Are you doing more floating rate? Are you actually looking at structures to hedge that? How, how are you thinking about specifically interest rate risk? Yeah, I think depending on the product, I think on the, on the special set side, which is already a very high yielding, I think the difference will be marginal. You know, if you, I mean, historically it's always been fixed. And I don't think people are moving away to floating because you know you're charging uh, you know kind of a high things type of return. So the the marginal interest rate changes will not uh, make a difference. And also at that rate, you will not also uh, try to increase uh, the rate to follow the the interest rate movement because it's probably kind of the ceiling. If you try to earn more in this kind of situation, you probably do it through, through an equity kicker type of instrument or invest in the equity of the company. But for the lower yielding uh, product, obviously the, the more direct lending type of product, yes, I think 
you know, I think floating rate is, is, is the way to go because you don't get paid uh, to take interest rate risk at that level. Yeah. And again, if you try to earn more, I think you, uh, the, the safest way to do it is just you gotta, you gotta look at the equity. Yeah. Matt, anything to add? Yeah. Um, look what Natish said, on the credit, I'll, I'll give two. On the credit selection side, for just risks, um, I do worry about geopolitical risk. Um, investment committees are, are too used to over the last 30 years saying, if that event happens, we have bigger problems to worry about in life than this investment. Unfortunately, that's no longer, uh, because that used to be a, a tail, tail, tail event, no longer is it a tail, tail, tail. It's now, you know, pick your probability. Mm. Geopolitical risk is real, and you do have to have some framework for underwriting that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about different scenarios and how that will impact each and, in, each and every individual credit. Um, I worry about a little bit about um, with the fundamental changes in supply chain, um, significant restocking and destocking cycles over the next five years, which just means that you need to make sure that in your fund, when you're investing, you have enough, enough money to follow your money. Um, because you likely will need some rescue capital or some liquidity capital to defend your position. Um, on the portfolio management side, look, I think the rate question is a really interesting one. Uh, with an inverted yield curve, it's, it is tough. It's, do, you, do you pick the short dated high, IR, you know, high um, interest rate um, position today, or do you pick something that on a cycle average basis or even relative to the forward curve looks attractive, but it may not be the, the best on a short dated basis? I think that's a really interesting portfolio management question that we debate um, all the time. And then, you know, I think one of the big differences in Asia that I found, um, and it's good that more private credit funds, I guess, are coming to the region um, uh, to solve this problem. But you know, you don't you don't really have the ability to risk manage. It's more much more difficult. You have fewer tools to risk manage in Asia after you've bought the position no because it's, it's tough. It's tough to sell. Like your, your risk management starts with credit selection. So. Um, it's not like you can say, oh, yeah, I kind of don't like uh, making this up, um, Australian private credit. Like you're not, you're not going to move that anytime soon, um, and uh, you can impact it on the margin. And so, you know, that you need to kind of really think about what risk management tools you're using up front, and get a little bit sophisticated with your market's risk guys um, to find interesting ways to hedge risk that you no longer want to take. Um, so those are the few things that I worry about in Asia. Yeah, useful. I'll take some of those tools, thanks. No. <laughs> so let's just pause there, see if there's any uh, questions from the, the audience. We've got uh, about seven minutes left. So any, any questions from the audience? OK, so question, I'm going to start with Denny, I think. Denny, what uh, is the single, and you only get one bullet here, right? <laughs> What is the single most important thing when you look at a, 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 a credit deal? Just one. Just pick one. I'm just going to ask you to pick one. So is it the promoter? Is it the industry? Is it the structure? What is you think that define? And this is okay. from an emerging, sure. developing market sense. Yes. Yeah. I think for me, it's, it's still the company itself, the fundamental of the company, the cash flows, uh, the business model, the revenues, and, and all this hard finance, basically. Got it. I think at the end of the day, we'll come back to that. It's, it's the company. It's the borrower cash flows. Correct. Natish, great company or great borrower? Which one are you? I know you're going to say both, but uh, <laughs> you're only, you're only, what are you going to go for? You go for the promoter, or are you looking at the underlying cash flows of the borrowers. So, so I hope I don't have to choose one of the two. Uh, so, <laughs> so if it is a great promoter but a lousy company or a lousy business, that would not work for us. If it is a great company but I think a question marks of the borrower or the promoter integrity, we will not lend money to them. Okay. So I think if I'll, you I'll, basically I'll, get I'll the... I'll get away with that. But the basic minimum is met for both the borrower or the, or the company or the business and the promoter. I think any day we will go with the promoter. Got it. Matt, what about from a developed market's point of view? Would you like a really good business in Australia? Or are you happy to bo go for a, well, a lousy um, promoter? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think we're all going to give the same answer. We want both. Yes. I think our, our, first, our first question in any, any pipeline meeting, it's almost even before what the company does. It's what problem are we solving and do we have, are, we, can, are we uniquely positioned to solve it? And if we can't answer that, then you know, it's... Um, less interesting to us. I understand. Good. Wei Xian? 
Should we address this uh, question? From oh, the sorry, there's a question there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So unlike uh, PEVC, private credit is relative nascent in the region. When do you foresee a tipping point uh, for the sector? And what are the factors that will drive it? Thanks for the question. Yeah. It's a good okay. one. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. So um, the, uh, I think the tipping point is now, actually. So I think, the, uh, I think what I just uh, mentioned about the... Uh, the, the high yield, uh, you know, uh, the freeze in the high yield market. I mean, it's a very serious problem. We're talking tens of billions of dollars of you know high yield bonds that cannot get refinanced, and the, the natural you know way to go is to move into the private credit market because you know I think for the longest time you know it was powered by you know private bankers going to their high net worth clients and saying yeah you know here you go a bunch of bonds uh, you know the yielding sort of high singles I'll give you leverage. You know, and that was easy to do when rates were at zero and, uh, you know, get you, uh, your returns up to the mid-teens, right? You know, nobody reads the docs, nobody realizes it's all unsecured, you know, it, there's, there's not much, uh, you know, proper DD. And I think, uh, you know, where private credit excels is that, you know, we actually have, you know, proper, you know, we actually read the docs. We read the docs, we make sure there's security, we, we make sure, uh, you know, we go and, uh, you know, we kick the tires, we visit the factory, we talk to the... You know, we talk to the, uh, the, the the borrower. You know, it's a lot more uh, you know detailed work uh, than uh, you know what what's uh, what's done in the uh, public markets. And uh, you know, I think this is the opportunity uh, really for us to kind of step up the plate and uh, you know uh, and really go for uh, you know to, to go for all these opportunities. Tipping points. Any anyone want to add anything to tipping points? I, I think we're there as well, particularly for Southeast Asia. I think we over the hump, and the market's going to grow. Another question from the uh, panel is, what is a good IRR target for secured lending for the next three years? And I'm going to say developing markets, Denny, and then Matt, you might want to chime in there for developed markets. Okay. I think for me, I guess it depends on what is the definition of secured lending, right? We're talking about, because our, all of our loan is always secured, right? But I guess it's where you are in the capital structure. For a senior secured uh, in Southeast Asia, I guess depend also, right? If we're talking more about the emerging market in Southeast Asia, I would say low to mid teens is kind of going to be the range. Uh, continue to be. I don't see any much changes. Of course, you can structure it with the with the floating rate, so it will it will basically uh, it will move with the interest rate, but you know it's going to be it's going to be around that range. Got it. Yeah. Matt, uni tranche in, in, in Australia, what's, uh, what's happening? It's a, good, it's a good question. Look, I mean, the, the market would tell you um, risk-free plus 450 to 500. I think it will stay in that range in, in Australia. Spreads aren't widening at all? What's that? Spreads are not widening? A little, a little bit really? uh, on the margin. Um, okay. I think, in the, you know, I think um, in the U.S. you could see, because you, you have uniquely um, large, cap, large cap direct lending, that not a lot of people do. I think you can get an extra 50, base, 50 75 basis points for doing that. Um, and then interesting comment on the emerging markets. You know, in, in India, for instance, I think we see, call that plus 100 basis points and if you translated that to US dollar amount uh, for the, over the next three-ish three years. Yep, great. One more question here. This will be the final one, I think. Um, what are some of the measures and, I guess, tools for managing micro-risks? Natish, why don't we uh, start with you? Sure. Again, I think uh, Matt alluded to that earlier. There are not that much you can do once you have the loan on your books in terms of managing it. Uh, the liquidity is not there. Uh, you don't have the CDS market. You don't have some of the macro hedging tools uh, in any meaningful way. So the clear, I think the most important managing micro risk is really at the deal selection when you're putting the deal together. I think my experience being in emerging developing markets uh, 27 years now, I think if you pick the right borrower groups in terms of integrity, People who don't have a track record of, uh, I think, not worked well with minority shareholders or with, or with other creditors in the past. If you are good on the, on the industry that you choose, if you're not going with any of these volatile industries, and if you structure the deal well. And there, I think, local knowledge really comes in. It's not really what the lawyers tell you and give you a legal opinion and say, okay, this is enforceable or that is enforceable. I think based on your experience, you know what security works in what markets and what really gives you negotiating position when things are not going well. I think those three things, if we take care of when we are putting the deal together, I think uh, I, I can say, I think 27 years, we actually had no default in any of our emerging markets or developing market deals. So I think there's something you can do about in terms of micro, managing micro risk there. 
I'm sorry I wasn't able to ask about Indian bankruptcy. We didn't throw <laughs> out time. Uh, Wei Xian, anything to add on that question about um, <laughs> micro risks? Yeah, I think it's uh, you know due diligence. I mean, that's that's the key. I mean, you really got to just do your work and uh, you know uh, you know meet the company, find out uh, you know as much as you can, and uh, you know track records are obviously important. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully, you found the panel interesting, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.